Good evening. Wow, that you snuck up on us here. We uh, we were trying to get the light on, and you you came in early, but you're welcome. Come on in, have a seat, and just relax. We're gonna go over some good stuff tonight. Tonight, I want to talk to you a little bit about veneer, and um, it's it's not cheap. It's not cheap in the way of uh, cheap furniture if you make something out of veneer. Veneer's got a bad name mostly because of the poor manufacturing practices of the early 1900s. I mean a lot of us have seen the Singer sewing machines with the veneer popping off. Um, not that those weren't nice but the way that the veneer was applied to hardwood at cross angles it often uh, would pop off because it would it wasn't over a stable substrate. So a lot of it is the method in with which you use veneer. Some of the most beautiful and valuable pieces of furniture in the world today are actually made mostly with veneer or quite a lot of it involved. So I want to show you a little technique tonight of using veneer in a sunburst pattern on a round table. And we'll get to that just in a second. I just want to thank you for showing up. This is really a lot of fun for us and we love doing it. So many of you say, oh, thank you so much. And, you know, I can't believe the work you put in. We really do love doing this. And, you know, if I could do it for free, I would. And I, <laughs> some would argue I've done it for free most of my life <laughs> when you look at the way a furniture maker's life is. But no, it's been great. And, and now it's just wonderful to open the doors and to share a lot of the experiences I've had with you. And one of the ways we've been doing that lately is through courses and live streaming courses. And this is really a great time if you're new to us because we just finished a course on this little round table. And this is what we're gonna be jumping off. You're probably sick of seeing this. <laughs> <laughs> I know I am. <laughs> <laughs> I love that table. That was that sounded pretty good. We're gonna ship that table away soon. And uh, <laughs> where was I? I'm kidding. <laughs> I really am. This top, this was um, <laughs> this was the mismatched top that <laughs> we talked about in the course. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> I don't know why I'm laughing. It's not even that funny. Mm -hmm. But uh, in the course. We went over it. We just made this table and we made this veneered top. And I showed you kind of a random technique for laying out the, the veneer. But tonight I'm going to show you book matching the veneer on the top. But I'm, I'm just bringing that up because this course just ended. But you know, it's never too late to get in on this course because we post, we upload and make the videos available. So it's as if you're right here and we went through a lot of techniques. If anybody was in there and had a good time, if you want to chat in on that, I'd love to hear it. But I have seen some photos. People have been sending me photos of their tables and project process. And it's really heartwarming to see such beautiful work everybody's doing. And so anyway, that's the so, first one. But the next project, not that that wasn't great. I really enjoyed that. The next project is a modern writing desk, something like this. And I'm telling you about it because this Saturday, we're kicking it off in two days on, at 10 a.m. Is the card in the way? Nope. OK. And uh, this is not finished, obviously. But I just finished the drawings. Uh, and those should be back from the printer tomorrow. And we're going to be sending those out to you. and you'll have them soon enough. But this, this table of, of all the things I've done, I mean, I have done a lot of plans. How many plans do we have now of furniture? Close to 18 or 19, I believe. So a lot of those furniture projects, I'm not downgrading them, but some of you know I've been part of the New Hampshire Furniture Masters Group. Um, it's a custom furniture makers from, started out in New Hampshire, now it's other regions of New England mainly. 
And there's about 20, 25 members. And we each year would make these custom original pieces, which we would put in these exhibits. And they're, they're photographed beautifully and, and made into a, um, a catalog every year. And quite often, we would have auctions. And it was really a lot of fun. We, through the years, we had so many. I mean, this, this has been 25 years I've been a member of that. And we've had Lee Kino came and was our auctioneer once. And there have been a lot of high points. What else? <laughs> no, we've had so many great people involved with it. But I wanted, I've been wanting to share that with you, but we didn't have it last summer. Uh, but this summer, we, there will be something um, later in the year, I think in the fall. But I'm saying that because most every piece I've done in the, in the project list, I wouldn't consider those pieces Furniture Masters exhibit worthy. Not because they're not really nice, but they weren't like custom designed. And just that little bit of higher style. And this modern writing desk is the first piece I'm sharing with you that I would consider in that category. And yet, it has some, some pretty fundamental um, approachable techniques. It's not over the top. Uh, so if you've built a, a table, a shaker table, if you have some experience, you'll, you'll find this enjoyable. Um, but it's going to be more contemporary. And what I love about it is that it, it's an original design. So just to show you really quickly, the legs are going to have this really sweet curved uh, taper. And then we're going to give the tops of the, le of the legs a little shape. This top has not been shaped yet. I've got a special shape for it. But you can kind of see. So the legs are going to pierce through, appear like through the corners of the tabletop. The, the desk is going to be 18 by 44. And it's going to have a walnut base. And the drawer fronts, this, these are just kind of dummy fronts right now. But these will be drawers with custom original pulls that you can make. And then the top is going to be some really highly figured, um, some type of maple, I think. Because what I want it to look like uh, is almost like a cloud on the top resting. So it's, it's considered a floating top because it's not directly appearing to be connected to this rail. And once these are curved out, see there's a three quarter inch space in there. But behind, underneath, there are these supports. So these legs are gonna come up and as if this is floating and this will be shaped really nicely. We'll put a cool edge on it and this top will be almost like a cloud. So, you know, sometimes we, we have to name our furniture, right? You know, in the art world, you, you put a little name to your work. Whoops, you're getting snagged up there. Is that right? It's okay. Seems like you were, you were running out of line. No worries. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, but sometimes we name our work, you know, to, it's kind of corny in a little way, you know, to put a name to a, a piece of furniture. But in other words, it, it really is kind of meaningful because sometimes you have a story behind the idea that germinated, you know, this design. So this table, you know, I got to thinking about it, how it comes through. Like so often you sit at a desk and you want to be inspired. Maybe you're writing or um, you know, just thinking about some creative idea that's trying to come to you. Well, I thought this would be neat because if this was like a, a cloud and it, it'll be a beautiful piece of figured wood, I think a Goose Bay, I'm going to go check out. They've got some over there. But if this were a cloud and the legs are piercing through the cloud. So this piece, I haven't told you this yet, I don't think. But it's going to be like a console writing table or computer desk, but I'm thinking of calling it breakthrough because of the legs piercing through the cloud and that, that kind of moment when you feel that kind of epiphany or an idea or you get jazzed to write something fresh and original from yourself. So mm. this will be an inspiring piece of furniture. Poetic. Thank you. <laughs> 
Do you mean that? I do. You know, I like that stuff. Okay. <laughs> so hopefully it'll be an inspiring piece, not just to work on, but to have in your home if you want to make it along with me. I would love, this is the first time I've ever done this. Like, I, usually we make our things for the exhibit, and, you know, they're all finished, and they're on a pedestal, and we're dressed up, sipping wine, and, and people are coming through the exhibit, and we're like, yes, you know, talking about whatever. <laughs> Not looking at all like the ragged, dusty messes we are most of the time. But this time, I'm, I want to carry you through. If you want to make this, it'll be a blast. And I'm even thinking of entering it in the next Furniture Masters exhibit. So it could even be sold at the exhibit, and I'll, I'll let you in on all the reality of that, like what it sells for, the whole experience. And if we do have an exhibit, I'll even walk around the exhibit and we'll videotape and get some uh, good ideas from a lot of the other makers. Who knows? Cool. We might even have a breakthrough. Okay, <laughs> enough of that. But that course, if you want to in on that, that starts this Saturday at 10 a.m. Eastern Time. And you can get more information about it on the website, epicwoodworking.com. And of course, if you like this content, please subscribe and like and share and all that. We'd love to have you. Yeah, hit that a thumbs up. Part. That'd be great if you like it. All right. So tonight I want to show you, as I mentioned, the technique of veneering where you book match the pieces. Now, to do, actually, I'll just show you the piece. This is an example of a book match piece, and I want to put together the veneer to show you this pattern, how you make this pattern with veneer. And this is zebra wood. I've, some of you have seen this already, but this is like some really striking material. And that's the actual color. This just has an oil varnish. There's no amber added to this. It's, it's got these distinct stripey patterns. It's an African hardwood. And you can buy it in the solid, but it's quite costly. But you can get it in veneer quite reasonably. So this is a little bit challenging to use as an example. But what, what the heck? We'll do that, okay? So, but you can see every seam, how this is a seam. There's, this is an eight piece match. So I wanted to say, yeah, there's eight seams. And uh, I was thinking there might be seven seams, but that would only be if they were in a line. They're in a circle. So you got eight seams too. And every seam is a mirror of the other. I was going to hold it like, and they're each like near perfect, except for this one. I was going to hold my hand over that while I showed you. So look at how perfect all of those are. <laughs> hey, we, we're real here. Yeah. We're live and always susceptible to. Well, usually when you get to the end, it's pretty challenging. But with a, with a veneer like this, it's very unforgiving because it's just lines. And, and what I'm going to explain to you in a second is, as you go down through the layers of veneer needed to make a top like this, the grain is changing because the lines don't grow perfectly perpendicular up through the board. So check this out. This is like if you buy a flitch of walnut, this is a, and there's got to be at least 20 pieces of walnut here. But if you buy veneer and you get it, usually you'll get several sheets. And when you get them, the vast majority of the time, they are sequential. They're just as they were sliced off the tree. So every following piece of veneer looks almost identical to the one above it. But it's not perfectly identical because the growth rings are going one way or another. And as you move down, it starts to change a little bit. But the sheet right next to it looks as close as it could be. But if you drop down about five sheets or 10 sheets, if you look really closely, it'll be a slightly different pattern. Now, this is pretty blah, linear, quarter sawn um, walnut. But with higher figured woods, like zebra wood, 
and something like this crotch mahogany look at that this is this changes I've got six or seven pieces here you want a table out of this do I want to sorry what was the question do you want a table out of this <laughs> would you like one this I've got I'd this like to make it I will take it I will make this I'll probably do a video I'll probably do some kind of course with this because this would be an awesome high style demi loon table so I've got six pieces. It's not really enough to make a round table, um, you know, of some size. But I will do a demo of something using this. But this changes pretty rapidly as you go down through the layers because it's so intense and flame and it, it doesn't last all the way down through. So that plays a role in how you do this book matching technique just to know that the veneer changes as you go down. Let me set this aside for a second. OK, so I am going to use this veneer. And while I'm thinking of it, if you didn't get the memo that I, I mentioned, excuse me, i got to blow my nose for a second. Catch it. Go ahead. Okay. Good. Sorry about that. Um, if you didn't hear, I think I mentioned a couple weeks ago, uh, Berkshire veneer in Berkshire, Mass, right, Western Massachusetts, is closing their doors. They're selling their entire stock. This is a hot time to check it out. Now we're live right now, and it's what is this? May the sixth, seventh. May the 6th and in 2021. So they're going to have all their stock gone, I think, by this month. They have to get it rid of it all. So there's some really good deals there if you want to check it out. You can look at the flitches at Berkshire. I think it's just Berkshire Veneer Company um, or BerkshireVeneer.com. Just do a search. Um, check it out. You might find some cool deals. Anyway, if you're going to do something like this, you need to have those consecutive layers. So we're going to just do a, an eight-piece match like that tabletop. And to do eight pieces around a circle, you need eight of these pie-shaped pieces, 45 degrees. So two of them will make 90, and eight of them will get around the whole 360. Uh, if we're doing more, if we're doing a 10-piece match, we would need what degrees? 36. Very good. Well, you've been listening. Awesome. And It's surprising when it comes to math figures. No, oh, all right. And then we're going to do a 12-piece match. What degrees do we need? Oh, shoot. Don't do that. 30. <laughs> 30 degrees. Beautiful. She's on top of her game. No, I knew you would get a little <laughs> tight on that. That's okay. You did great. So uh, we're going to use a 45-degree and get the 8-piece match for this particular thing. So if you were planning on an eight-piece match, you've got to have at least eight pieces of veneer. So that can be kind of costly sometimes if you if the veneer sheets are 10 feet long, then you've got to buy a lot more square footage to do that. Some of the flitches, if you look, if you go to Berkshire Veneer or certainly wood or whatever, when you look on their websites, you'll see some section that says figured woods. So you'll see burls or crotch mahoganies, different crotch designs like this. Um, so usually when you see a high style crotch or a high style um, radiant sunburst pattern, you're going to see crotch mahogany. That's the ultimate, really. But I like using linear grain um, like this or like that uh, ribbon cut mahogany up on the wall. So we'll start with this and Tom did you mention yet the the thickness of veneer that you use? Did you say that yet? I didn't say it yet but you can use pretty much any thickness but the standard thickness you get when you buy it is a, a 42nd 
of an inch, 1 42nd. If it's 1 10th of an inch, that's considered like thick veneer. Sometimes you get a 16th of an inch, like at, um, at Certainly Wood, and I think at Berkshire Veneer, you look at the thickness, because it sometimes it'll specify that this is thick grade veneer. If it's thicker, it's kind of nice, because it, you're not as worried about sanding through it, or if you have to break the edge hard, or whatever you're doing with it. Maybe you want to build up a thickness faster, make your own plywood with some, then you might want thicker veneer. So that's what you go for. But the standard is a 42nd of an inch, and that's really more than enough. You, I have, I have rarely sanded through veneer. It's, it's pretty tough. It depends on the species a little bit and what you're actually doing, but you shouldn't have to worry about that. I should mention that the uh, links to Berkshire veneer and certainly wood and some other veneer you think it was Okay, just... we're back, we're back. Oh, okay. Uh, I'm going to ask the question again? again. I'm not sure where we lost you guys. Um, the, I did mention that the links are in the description to Berkshire veneer and certainly wood and other things, so look there. And then also Kevin was asking what's the best way to make the 45 degree pie blank and other degree blanks. Well, uh, Kevin, the, you've got to have some way to cut a 45 degree angle. Like if you have a chop saw or the old, um, no, you wouldn't have one of those radial arm saws, whatever. If those will have a setting on them where it'll show you 45. Now, it's not always dead on. If you have a cross cut sled, you can cut a wedge to uh, help you cut a 45. We we went over last last time, we went over, not last time, but a few episodes ago, we did a shooting board and we showed a 45 degree angle. I actually have this beautiful Felder sliding table saw that has an unbelievably accurate swing arm on it. So I cut this on that. But before that, I would just cut them on a chop saw and check them for accuracy with a combination square like this. So you need something to give you a true accurate angle. Now, if you're stuck and you, you don't have that, but maybe you have a bandsaw. If you could just cut a dead square corner, if you can cut a square corner, then you can um, find the center point actually with a compass. You can kind of come out from the point, make a radius, and then take it from each side. And you will be able to find the center of that arc. And if you just draw that line to the point and cut that with whatever you got, if you got a, uh, you still got to smooth it out at the end. So if you have a joiner, it's great. But I'm, I'm not sure what you have. But you just got to be a little resourceful if you don't have, obviously, a, um, a Felder slider. I mean, I got by for a long time figuring out other ways. <laughs> but you want to have, you got to have some way of checking it. So if you know you got that, you're good. Bert's yeah. suggesting an L fence. An L fence? <coughs> Does that work? Yeah, I'm not sure how he's thinking of using the L fence. Um, that's a, the L fence is a type of attachment that goes on to your table saw fence. Um, but I, yeah, I think I think we're thinking along the same lines, Bert. Like I was thinking of attaching. You could, if you have a crosscut sled, and you can draw a 45 degree line on it, then you could tack a piece of wood, a straight edge on that line and use that as your fence on the crosscut sled. That's a, that's a pretty good way to go too. Now, it doesn't have to be absolutely dead 45. You want it to be as close as you can. Sometimes one of the ways I check it is I'll cut a couple of them and then if you put the two together, the two wedges together, and you have a, a true square that you can trust, then you want to see if you're square with two pie pieces together. Okay, so I would have one like this, and I would have one in there. And so I'd know I was good at a 45 if I'm square across two. Now, the last piece 
of your, of your uh, design, which I'm going to show you, is cut to fit. So it doesn't have to be perfect. But when you're going for these lines here, it can be more problematic. If the last piece is not the same, you're going to have an issue. But uh, there's other ways of getting around that, too, that I could talk about. But anyway, um, let's just get on with this. Uh, so I've got, I've got nine layers here of zebra wood. And I'm going to cut my, my design pattern out of this. Now, if you look, you might have to zoom in on this. I'll come in. I don't know how far away you are on the lens. Let me get it on this side. Okay, so if you look at the end grain, you can see how the, those lines are carrying right down the ends of the pieces. So you want to align after you've cut it. Try to keep it together nicely because it, usually it'll come stacked beautifully. So we're going to align those so they all look nice and true straight down through the board, okay? Now, once I've got that corner, plus I want to get it flush, I cut these on the cross-cut sled with a board, like, sandwiching them so they wouldn't fracture too much. And if you do it with a finer tooth blade, you'll get a smoother cut. I didn't switch out my blade, but it came out pretty, uh, pretty nice. All right, so now I'm going to tape this to hold it in position. Once I've got it nice and linear, and then I'll get it across the other end, making sure I'm pretty flush. It should be good, pretty good over there. Now these are maintained, I maintained um, I maintain the numbers here. Now I'm going to show you after, oh shoot, I should have numbered them first. Okay. No, I can do it after, sorry. Okay, so I've got this, you should, it would have been better to number them, but I got carried away thinking about the wedge. So I'm going to tape this one, get my lines all nice and true on this end. They look pretty good. See them going tracking nice and true vertically there. I'm going to put a piece of tape right over to hold that in position. I'll do it at the other end. And we should have them pretty accurately true. Now, whatever grain it is, you'll probably be able to see it pretty clearly. Once they're taped together, you're good to go. All right. Now, I've cut these about a little over, let's see, about three-eighths of an inch longer than my wedge. And the wedge is longer, a little bit longer than I need for the circle, at least a quarter inch. So I'm going to be plenty long with the veneer. Now, I could just draw a line down the center here, but... I've got another method I'll show you in a second. But what we want to do is decide where we want to position the wedge for the best effect. Now this is so linear, it's not going to matter that much. But let me show you a little old trick that we use sometimes, more with highlier, higher figured woods. But if you take a, two mirrors like this and you sweep them in like on the wedge, then I take the wedge out. If you look in there, can you see it with the camera? Mm -hmm. You see actually the reflection, and you actually see the entire tabletop in the mirrors going all the way around. So sometimes what happens when you do this technique, you realize that you might have a shadow or something in there that's creating a funny looking repeating blotch in the middle, or maybe even a star and maybe you want a star, but maybe you don't, and it's whatever the shape is. So as I go across, you can see how the design changes, almost like one of those old kaleidoscopes. So you can get a good vision of what you've got there. If I bring in the, one of the crotch mahoganies, let's look at this. 
this is this is more interesting, I think. With the crotch mahogany, this <laughs> is showing you like a dynamic. I want to see that myself. Oh, oh, sorry, <laughs> I knocked your light off. <laughs> what, what did I do? No oh, there it is. Okay. Oh, it's all bright. All right. So anyway, <laughs> hey, could I see? <laughs> Clank. Yeah, so. We're so technically savvy here. But that's what's really sweet about this. I mean, you can get a good look at what the crotch figure, sometimes you want. I'm always looking for it to be real kind of flamey, like this is a really nice figure in here. So it's a good technique to get a preview of what your book match is going to look like. All right. So here's our stack of wood. Now I'm going to find a center line. Just use my, my wedge here. And let's find a good place. That looks pretty good right there. So I'm going to make a little pen line right here. Actually, I'll slide it over. I might be able to get some more pieces out of this one. Sorry. Your camera is hitting my head. I'll step back a bit. No, it's, you can just zoom in, right? Yep. Yes, sir. Sorry. I'm going to tell the camera lady what to do. And then on the other end, I'll make another pen line right where I want this one to end. Now, I could make a line right here and try to see that every time. And I've got the, the pen line here. But it's easier, since we're over length here, let's make a saw cut about an eighth of an inch deep. And that will give us an accurate line all the way through the layers so we know where we are and orient them properly. So I'm just going to take a Japanese saw here and holding pressure, I'm going to come to that pen line and just draw. This cuts on the pull stroke and it cuts pretty fast. Just want a nice clean line about an eighth of an inch deep. I can do that on both ends. And this will show up really well, and I can align my wedges, the point, and that center line on the other end of the wedge using this, this mark. Okay. All right, that's good. Okay, so now, now I don't want to get confused. I need to keep these sequential because every other layer is going to open like a book so that that seam is a mirror match just like we saw in the mirror. So let me get a piece of chalk and usually I number them before I start this but let's take the tape off and we'll just start numbering away here. So my plan is to use the, the wedge in this direction here. So I'm going to put my numbers at the wider side of it. So right here it'll be one. Sorry, this could be, I don't mean to be two. And then Cinco, Seis, Siete, Ocho. We probably have some um, Spanish nu speakers listening. Nueve. All right. Those three years of Spanish just paid off. Okay. So now we want to, that's, that's the face side. But we also want to put our numbers on the opposite side with a circle around it because we want to know which is the mirror of which one. So again, we're going to repeat. So opposite, okay, that was one. Make 
sure I'm in the right spot. How about French? What's five? We might have some French people watching. I never yes, took French. Yes, probably. Our, our Canadian folks. Five? How about now? Ready? Don't. Come on, you know that, do you? Cinq, six. How Set. about this one? Set. And wheat. What's this one? Mike says you need a smaller piece of chalk. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Mike. I know. I'm, sc <laughs> I'm scratching around. <laughs> I was hoping no one would notice that. Thanks a lot. <laughs> Actually, it's. Uh, I have another box, but they're all colored, and I thought I would just use the white. Oh. All right. What was that one again? Neuf. And this was what? Wheat. Wheat. We have uh, a gentleman from Brazil listening, Tom, and Lupe, who's also. Oh, nice. So they liked my. Uh... Uh, yeah, <laughs> I don't know. Antonio didn't, didn't weigh in, but Lupe said, OK. OK, not, not bad, right? <laughs> Sorry. I, I don't really know the language. I wish I did. All right, so now we got those numbered. We got our center marks aligned all the way through. That's key. Now we're going to start cutting them. Now, when we cut through these layers, I'm going to be using a veneer saw. And the veneer saw is flat on one side. Okay, when it's when it's sharpened, it's flat and that flat side is what I'm going to reference off of the wedge when I cut them into wedge shapes. So as that saw goes down, it leaves a nice 90 degree surface on that little thin edge. Even though it's thin, it's important that it's a 90 degree surface because every one of those seams is going to butt up against another. Now on the off cut, this saw has a bevel cut on the teeth this way. So you can't really zoom in on that, but just trust me, these teeth are beveled like that to a very sharp point. So you get these razor sharp teeth here. And when you make the cut, you get that square cut here, but this piece that is on the off cut outside here is gonna have kind of a wedgy end to it. So that's not ideal to make your seam with. So that's always the waist side. Okay, so we always want to be cutting and knowing we're cutting vertically. So that's how we'll go and cut this. Now, we want to book match around this table. So let's get my big piece of chalk out again. And let's just kind of lay out our quadrants here. And then we'll divide it into eight. Okay, so there's approximately our eight slices. So we're going to start with one. We'll go with one face up. Now, we know that we want to flip and be book matched with the next piece. So we'll take two here, but we don't want two. We want two with a circle. So that's the back side of two, just so you can see. Whoops. With a circle, those. And then. Rather than putting number three right here, if we went right around the circle, where we went three face up, four circle, five face up, six circle, seven face up, eight circle. Look what happens. If you do that, if you go right around, you're going to end up with eight next to one. And that's eight layers down the stack. So that seam is not going to look like a very good book match. So what you want to do is when you're laying these out, rather than go right around, you're going to alternate across so that no piece is more than two away from another, from its neighbor. Okay? So we're going to go one, two. Now three is going to go over here. And it's going to be with a circle. Okay? Because it's every, you're never next to one. You're always next to the opposite side. Okay? Now four, where are we going to put four? Four is going to be face up. Rather than go around here, we're going to come back over here for four. So let's do that. And if, 
it's face up. And then 5, we'll put over here. 6, we're going to come back over this way, and we're going to put a circle. And 7 will be a circle. And 8 will be no circle. Okay? So that's how we're going to come around. So look what's happened. It's 1's next to 2, 3. So everyone is next to one that's one layer away. But when you get to the end, you don't have any big jumps by doing it that way, alternating. And that's a good way to get a nice mesh, especially when you're using something like crotch mahogany or something. By the time you get to the end, you'd be radically different. Okay? So that's how we want to cut our pieces, face up. We want one to be face up. Let's, I'll just keep this here for a second. One will be face up. Two, we want to cut that face. So we've got our nice trim. We'll cut this one. Three will be here. Four is face up. Five is face up. Six is circle. Seven is a circle. And eight is face up. And look, I got a ninth in case I screw something up. But I'll keep that off to the side. Hopefully we don't need it. All right, so now I'm going to just get them back in order. Okay, so now to cut them, I'm going to use the wedge. And it's just a nice process. I've got a nice sharp veneer saw. I'm on a piece of wood. That doesn't dull the saw as fast as the MDF. So I'm going to take, that's my center line. I'm going to match it up with that notch. There's a little notch right there. That's my, then I'll come down the other end and match it on this point with the notch at the other end. That looks good right there. Now I'm going to hold nice pressure down. This veneer is a little puckery, so it's not ideal for this, but it's right on the edge of needing to flatten. Okay, so I'm going to make some light passes. You want to make it in several slices. If you go too fast, you'll fracture it. Then I'm going to come around this side without moving and pull. Whoops. That was smooth. I want to pull from the point. See how light I'm holding this off? I don't, you don't have to grip it like that. I actually hold it quite light so I can feel it right against the fence. There we go. So that's a nice clean edge. And there's number one. And we take two. Now that's a circle facing up. So we've got them all nicely piled up there. And then we do the same thing. We've got to find that slot. There it is. Match up my, mark my center line. And then come down the other end. And I got my little cut right there. So that looks perfect. That looks good. Okay. Hold pressure and slice away. Come over the other side. All right. There we go. Okay. So there we've got two. And We'd go right on through the stack. Now, I'm not going to bore you by cutting them all. I already prepped some. So let's set this aside. Pick that up later. We'll put our pie piece back there. And let's bring up the pieces that I've already had cut. And we can start taping them together. All right, so here we go. Look at our pattern, one and two. So I've got one and then two right next to it. So I'm going to tack these together. Let's get a few pieces on my fingers here. All right, so when you're doing this, you can see the lines, how they match up. See that? You seeing yep, it? we're seeing it. 
Sorry, I was looking at a couple questions. Oh, okay. Dennis asked, is the point of the triangle aligned with the end of the small cut you put in the veneer? Yes, Dennis. Yeah, that's what I was doing. I was aligning the point at one end and then the center line at the other. But I didn't cut so deeply with the, with the saw that I was cutting into it. I was, I was about three-eighths long, and my saw cuts were about an eighth inch long, so I'm not worried about that. All right, so see, I'm trying to match these so all those lines look beautiful and mirrored. So I'll go ahead and tape it. I want, hopefully the point comes together beautifully too, and it does in this case. So that's what I'm trying to hit too. Is there, Carlos asking, is there a reason you're only doing them one at a time instead of stacking them when you're cutting? Yeah, um, if you, it would be, I'd have to align every one perfectly over on that notch and these are bubbly, and I wouldn't get a nice saw cut. It would start to fracture. The pressure on the, pay, on the piece is good. You're really good for one saw cut through. However, there are methods where you can sandwich veneer between two pieces of like plywood or something. And they, if they're truly aligned, you can actually run a saw down it. I've seen people use little circular saws and get a pretty smooth, clean edge. Or you can skim it on a router table and get a really nice surface. So, um, but if you want a good quality cut and accurate dimension in a case like this, you need to cut them at one at a time. And you get pretty good at it. It's kind of fun. It doesn't take very long f to cut eight pieces. Um, Can you just, uh, I know you've talked a lot about this before, but explain why you're not using veneer tape? Oh, tape. yeah. Um, the veneer tape, well, I'm assuming most people don't have veneer tape, but I do have a veneer tape dispenser that I like using, but um, it's, it's thinner. It's actually quite nice, but it's, it wets, you wet it almost like a stamp, and it gets very tacky and it's super thin, and it's really sticky, and it goes down great, and as it dries, it shrinks a little and really pulls it together. I found that this cheap... Um, tape from Walmart actually works quite well. It's thin, it's sticky, and it's a much easier to remove after the fact. Okay, so that's one of the advantages of using masking tape is that it's easier to remove. But it doesn't have quite, it's a, it's a little less the holding force, which, but it's not a problem. I've, I've never had a problem with it. You don't want to over stretch the uh, overwork the masking tape. If your seam's not great, you you know sometimes you have to pull it together a little bit. Then you want to use veneer tape. But the veneer tape, you know, quite often it requires a nice dispenser. And let me get some pieces out here. We could. I'll show you how fast we can take these up. Do you have any pointers on how you sharpen your veneer saw? Yeah. Um, that's a whole thing I'd have to show you one night, but um, I do it with a, a triangular chisel uh, file, small triangle file, and you go between each tooth. You have to have a good way of holding your saw blade, and I have a little special clamp I do that with, and I'll just hold that saw blade and um, go right around. I'd hit each tooth exactly with the same length of a stroke, you know, so that you're not dis disfiguring the end of your, of the piece, you know, like you're getting, there you go, so that the, the saw stays nice and true. So I'm holding the tape down there and I'm pulling it across the seam, I'm stretching it, so I'm getting a nice pull. Actually, if you use your roller like this, it helps. I use that with veneer saw and helps to flatten and really pull it together. Is there any other kind of tool that you would use possibly to cut other than a veneer saw? Um, there are different style veneer saws. There's, there's others that are like a block with the cutter there. Um, you can use a knife, but I don't like using a knife on something like this because the knife wants to often track with the wood fibers. So you really want to use a saw. It, it tracks more truly 
because it's sawing through the fibers and it won't get caught up and drift off. You never want to get drifting off, you know? <laughs> yeah. All right, so. Yeah. Uh, can you just talk a little bit about how delicate it is, the veneer is to you right now that you're working with? Um, Does it feel very delicate? No, it doesn't feel that delicate. It's just, this is a little more wavy. It's a little, like I said earlier, it's it's on the verge of needing to flatten, so it's a little more challenging to flatten. When you get most veneer, unless it's crotch, is going to be fairly flat when you get it. So um, there are ways of using like what's called veneer softener or flattener, and you spray the veneer, and then you put it between paper and some type of press, like heavy weight. If you're Some curious boards. about that, Tom did a whole, uh, several sessions focusing around that for a top that he was creating in, in the, the series number two. It's playlist number two of our Shop Night Live series where he designs a special, we call it a lily pad table. And there was a sequence of videos about the oh. veneer that he used. And it was really bubbly and needed lots of yeah, that was softening. So there was a couple sessions that discuss that if you're really curious about that softening process. Right. That was Carpathian Elm. That was a that was a tricky, very stubborn veneer. <laughs> the most <laughs> challenging. It was literally like potato chips across the whole thing, just all bubbly. But it did flatten pretty well. Um, that most times when you get veneer, when you buy a figured veneer, it's going to come between two pieces of heavy cardboard and it's going to be covered in plastic so that it's, it arrives to you at the same humidity it left wherever it was being stored. And um, so you want to keep it in that plastic wrap That's until you're ready to use it. That's how I usually go with it. And then if you can get it glued down. However, I still, quite often, you'll still need to treat it and flatten it, if it's, especially if it's a piece of highly figured crotch or something like that. So you see how after I stitch across the seams every two or three inches, I then run one long one right down the seam to hold everything tight. All right, so five, we want to come over how, here with how six. How wide is the table again here? How is the dimension on the top, Tom? This top? Yeah. Um, it's like 17 and a half ish. So these pieces are, I'm making like a little over 18 inch circle here. So we'll be able to trim it to our top. Michael has an interesting idea. Would it make sense to make a plexiglass wedge of various angles to lay on the stack to select the location? Yeah, collocation? absolutely. Yeah, that's, that is another technique, Michael. I, great, great point. Um, I've seen people use plexiglass as their because you can see through it. Um, so you can do that. The mirrors kind of affect the same thing, but it's more handy to have the plexiglass. I like the, um, I like a three quarter inch piece of, of um, Baltic birch ply like I was using there because to actually, as your cutter, because it's a high side, it's got nice weight and it leaves a nice clean edge. So, it's really sweet. I, I know at one time I've seen people, somebody that might be out there selling really accurate wedges. I thought of making some available for sale myself because I've got that felder and I thought I should just cut a bunch, but it's not really what I'm into. <laughs> I'd rather make furniture. All right, so look, we're coming around. Everything's looking pretty true. We're getting to the moment of truth, that last piece where you wonder, is it going to look like a match? But I, here's one of the little tip. I didn't actually cut the last piece yet. So um, I am going to slip it under and we'll make sure that it looks good before we cut even one side. And then we'll cut the other side to fit. Go. All 
All right. There we are. Now, let's get number eight. We know it's got to come in here. Let's find the point. Okay, there's my little point right there. I'm going to slip that under. So we're pretty close. Look at that. See that lines right there? If we can align this. Man, that looks pretty good. We're going to have a nice match. So I want to make a pencil line. So sometimes you have to compromise a little bit and get it close. But I could play around with this a little bit. But I think we're pretty good right there. Everything looks nice on both sides. What do you think? I love it. OK. <laughs> All right, so let me get the pencil. I love the, the warmth of the colors. Yeah, this, when you hit this with finish, it looks so good. I mean, I love it. I'm going to just go right, with, I'll just trace the pencil line all the way up. I'm going to go ahead and make this cut. And then we'll slip it back and mark the other side too. Because it's probably not exactly 45, so I'm not going to cut both sides just yet. I'm just going to get right on that pencil mark. That looks pretty good right there. And where's my Vanessa? Oh, okay. There it is. Nice. All right, let's slip that back in. See how it came out. You know, isn't that nice? I mean, it's so, I've, I've joked around that veneering is like, it's civilized cousin of regular woodworking, solid woodworking, because it's just quiet. You just, you can play the music on. That looks pretty good right there. Look at this, how it's matching up here. And it looks pretty close all the way down. Now let's see how it's going to fold in. That looks pretty good. All right. So holding pressure there, tight over there. Get this pressed down nice. Okay. I'm going to make a pencil line over here, just some points. Leaving the pencil line is not an issue, right? No, that'll get sanded off. Did I leave it? I didn't even look. No, it's not a problem. Okay, that looks pretty good. Let's go ahead and saw that. Right up to my pencil line there. I want to have a good straight edge. I could use another straight edge for this, but the wedge is doing its thing here. Just covering the pencil line. That looks good. You want to make sure this one's really good so that seam pulls up. All right. Let's see how it fits. That's nice. All right, I'm going to start taping. I'll get some more tape. We'll get this last one. Fit in, and then we'll flip it over and see how it looks. That'll be the test. We're not actually going to glue this down to anything, but that'll be enough for the evening here. So let's see what happened. Get that right in there nice. Pull it up. Now, sometimes you'll see a lot, well, lots of times, you'll see in the center of tables like this, there'll be some decorative element right in the center, either a star or maybe a, a button or a circle. Um, and that's not just decorative, but it's to cover up. Sometimes in matching this, you can't get the point perfect, you know, and that's okay. Um, like it might be a little mismatched or slightly open there for some reason, but um, usually I try to get the point perfect. And but if not, you can always put a decorative thing, and so. Those other tops that I showed you earlier, those have a compass rose design on them. And we didn't get into that in the course on the little round table, but 
I did provide the pattern for that compass rose on the drawings for that little round table. So and we have a video already up online you can watch of making that compass rose. Man, this is fitting together beautifully. And the lines are coming together nicely. So Kay is curious if you've ever used a paper cutter to cut veneer. I have not, but I'm not sure. I think there is some kind of method like that out there. There's probably every kind of method, you know, to cut it, but it'd have to be a really nice slicer. It's just wood is kind of brittle when it's dry like this. I'm going to go over the center point now. And then right out over the seam. So now we've got a complete taped up job. We'll get everything ironed out. And then if we're doing a real top here, um, in the course I show how to get the center, how to cut it to the circle and glue it down and all that. But for tonight, we're just talking about making this design. And there you have it. Look at that. Beautiful book match pattern with every seam a mirror of the other. And that's the method. So by going through the way we did and laying them out, no two pieces, no pieces are more than two sheets away. So you see how well it matches up in the end. And that's what the top would look like. And then after it's glued up, we then would put, on this one I inlaid a compass rose, put a nice edge binding around. And then when it's finished, this is with no color added. It gets that really rich honey color and those lines really pop. I added the uh, videos for the compass rose and the edge binding in the description links to those as well. Nice. Yeah. So, hope you enjoy that. Any, any other questions? I don't think so. Wow. Perfect we time. We answered a lot of them, so that's good. Yeah, we did. We had a nice time talking a long way. But uh, one thing I do want to mention is that the press we used for this was actually a manual press by Roar Rocket. Uh, a company that started as a skateboard laminating company. And this is the bag. This one, I've got, a, I've got a top in here right now that's due to come out, but it's, it's a uh, mahogany one like the one I showed you earlier. But this is a manual press bag. So you can get into this method, and this puts down incredible pressure, and that's how I press the veneer on tops like this. But this bag, this whole system is like $70. You can get it through Roar Rocket. We've got a link on them too. But if you go to get a, a, a power bag like with the pump, I mean, you can be up to $1,000 for that system easy. But if you just want to get into it, you can get all sizes of manual bags and exert the same atmospheric pressure just by hand if you're just going to do a few of them. Rich is asking about glue and the finish on the finished one. Would, he, would it be wise to direct them to the veneering supply, simplified video for the glue technique? Well, the glue, like, of how to spread it and put it on, yeah. I also did that in the course. If you want to, if you were thinking of making the table, that's in the course. But there's another video called Veneering Simplified where I did a almost a three-hour demo for the Guild of New Hampshire Woodworkers here. So it's a video from the side, and I'm talking to a group, but it covers uh, some of the principles we talked about yeah, tonight. Yeah, the, the uh, link to that is also in the description yeah. below. There's a number of glues you can use, like um, you could use a urea formaldehyde glue, which is really brittle and hard, but for something like this, I just use Type Bond 3. Um, it's plenty rigid and strong enough to, to hold this. I mean, as far as it gets concerned with sometimes with creep, and those glues can creep slightly, but with a small table like this, it's not an issue. It's usually an issue with larger formats. And the finish that you put on the top? Oh, the finish is um, water locks. So I started with like a Danish oil and several coats and then I finished with Waterlocks satin. Now you can just get Waterlocks original and if you like the satin you can 
get a can of that as well. It's not inexpensive though. That's why I build up the base coats with Danish oil and then waterlock satin. But it's a beautiful water prevent, water resistant finish. It does an awesome job. Bob's asking, uh, do you ever do a compass rose for a 12 piece pattern? Ever done that? Um, I have not, but you could. It's nice because you add a cup, you add four more points um, to the rows. I've seen them; they're big, and yeah, you can add more points to it. But um, I think they usually go eight to sixteen. Actually, they usually don't go twelve because if it's a true compass, you want those um, other points like gradients in between. You know what I mean? So, but. Um, Anyway, that, that's one compass rose. I've also done tables where I've done a 10-piece match and done a five-pointed star. And that looks pretty nice, too, on a, on a top. You want to do a true five-point star. It's a little more, it's not that hard to figure out, but you just draw out your, your shapes and then do your inlay. It's not a compass rose, but it's more of a star. So, well, any others? I think we're done. All right. I hope you enjoyed that. That was fun, huh? Wow. So especially those of you who took the course and you wanted to see the book match method of veneering your top, there you go. You can do anything you want now on your top. Um, and one more reminder about the course, if you came in late, we've got this modern writing desk. We're going to start on Saturday. And this is not finished. The finished one is going to transform, and I just know you're going to love it. And I've, I've got these custom design pulls that you're going to make um, by hand that will just beautifully blend in with all that. So if you want to get in on that, it's go to our website, epicwoodworking.com. And also, if you just want to know more what's going on and be caught up, join our mailing list there, and we'll, we'll let you know anytime we have new uh, features coming on or something of note on Shop Night Live or new courses and all that. So thank you so much for hanging out. If you enjoy this content, please subscribe and also share with your friends and hit the thumbs up. That's always good. <laughs> yes, yes. But we really enjoy having you here and we um, look forward to having you back next Thursday night right back here in the shop in Canterbury, New Hampshire, same time and channel. We'll see you then right back at Shop Night Live. <laughs> Good night, everybody. Good night. Thank you so much.